Uh, my name is Steve Gottlieb. I'm here to talk about the uh, Lattice QCD on Blue Waters, which is a PRAC grant uh, that's actually coming to an end. Uh, Robert Sugar is from UC Santa Barbara is the PI on this grant. And actually, it involves what's called US QCD, which involves most of the people in the United States doing numerical QCD calculations. And there's actually two different groups that are supported through this uh, grant. So here are a bunch of collaborators. Um, the first three people are involved. Um, well, Alexei Bazovov recently moved to Indiana, and he's working on the paid program. Nuno Cardoso and Mike Clark are for GPU programming, as is Matthias Wagner, who was a postdoc at Indiana. Uh, and Matthias and Nuno were both part of a cooperative grant with uh, NCSA. Matthias has gone on to work in NVIDIA, so he's still working on QCD code. Uh, Carlton Dattar is one of the main architects, as Doug Toussaint and I are, of the Milk Code. And then the people on these two lines are involved in the nuclear physics part of this calculation using Chroma, and we'll talk something about what they're doing as we get through the talk. So um, Chow Run ga gave us a list of topics to talk about, and I gave a similar uh, talk last year. So there's a certain amount of overlap, but I decided instead of focusing on physics that people may or may not understand or be that excited about, I'd actually try and follow her directive to say something about the computing. So there will be uh, a considerable amount of that. But as, as background, so uh, why do we do these calculations in QCD? One reason is because uh, our knowledge of QCD limits what we can get out of certain experiments. And there are certain things uh, in, that we need to understand better to help guide what the experiments look for, particularly in nuclear physics. Now, um, QCD, unlike quantum el electrodynamics and the weak theory, uh, needs non-perturbative methods. The coupling is just too strong to, uh, to draw Feynman diagrams and calculate them one by one or a few by few. Uh, now, lattice QCD is a first principles calculational tool. It's not just a model of QCD, it's the theory, uh, but it's written in such a way that we can uh, deal with it on a computer numerically. And the, as I mentioned, there are two different groups working as part of this PRAC. One uses what's called the highly improved staggered quark action. And there we mainly try and get fundamental parameters of the standard model. And these include things like quark masses and what's called the CKM mixing matrix, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, on the nuclear physics side, a different action is used. You can discretize the theory in different ways. This is called the Wilson-Clover action. And um, what's studied there are the masses of the bound states and also various decays, and in particular, exotic states of QCD, which might include gluonic excitations in addition to uh, quarks. Um, so these have not been seen, but they're very much uh, in the experimental program at Jefferson Lab. Um, this is a slide that Robert Edwards, one of the investigators on the nuclear physics side, uh, sent to me. He's at Jefferson Lab. And uh, this was presented in our annual all-hands meeting about a month ago. Um, so this shows one, two, three, four, five different um, um, documents where uh, people from the JLab theory group were working very closely with the experimentalists to try and help them uh, guide, to help guide their experiments. Um, so in particular, uh, GLUEX is an experiment that involves uh, one of my, or a couple of my colleagues at Indiana where they're going to look for exotics. And um, we'll talk later, if I get to it, about some of the uh, money that has been spent to upgrade the JLab accelerator in order to do these experiments. Um, this is one piece of physics that I decided to show from Robert. Um, this curve here uh, represents um, the phase shift for a calculation with um, the quarks heavier than nature, making uh, a quark anti-quark bound state. The lowest one is the pion. In nature, it's 135 MeV. In this calculation, the quarks are heavier because it's hard to make the quarks as light as in nature. That was 371 MeV done about a couple of years ago. 
And this is a similar calculation of the phase shift, now with the pion reduced to 236 MeV. So we have another 100 MeV to reduce uh, the pion mass to get to the physical uh, mass. What happens is there's a shift in the resonance behavior. This rapid phase, shift, phase change is evidence of a resonance, and that resonance is the rho meson, the uh, lowest uh, mass vector meson in nature. And so the mass has come close to the rho meson mass, which is 770 MeV. But the interesting thing here is that the coupling that this resonance uh, describes the decay into two pions is just about the same. So you can get some nice physics out of that, even though we haven't gotten to the physically light uh, quark masses yet. Um, so now one of Chao Ran's questions is, uh, why blue waters? And uh, we'll describe a little bit about how our calculations are done. So most lattice field theory calculations are done in two stages. One thing you have to do is create these things called gauge configurations, which are snapshots of the uh, the chromo uh, electric and chromomagnetic fields uh, of the system. And generally, you ins uh, create large ensembles of these, which represent the quantum fluctuations in the system. And once you have an ensemble, um, you compute physical observables, which are expectation values of uh, different operators with that, within that background field. And the first stage, as I say here, is done in just a few streams. And so this needs to run quickly in order to produce these ensembles, which are stored on disk and on tape for long-term usage. And typically now, we have a, a thousand of these snapshots per configuration in order to reduce our statistical uh, um, errors. And so then once you have an ensemble generated, you can run a thousand jobs at the same time if you had the capacity to do that. Those jobs uh, don't necessarily have to run on a large number of nodes and they don't necessarily have to uh, complete that quickly because you can run them in parallel if you have the capacity. Okay, and um, so on blue waters, in addition to the ordinary XE nodes, there are XK nodes with GPUs, and we've made use of uh, them. Although uh, with the success of people uh, making more GPU code, we get to a situation where uh, it's pretty busy on the GPUs. So the Wilson-Clover gauge configuration runs quite well on the GPUs, and I'll describe some of that later. Uh, and for the HISC calculations, the day, uh, decay constant calculations that I'll mention later, they also run on GPUs, but we have not been using the GPUs to generate the HISC configurations. Um, and generally, we need some fairly large partitions to generate the configurations, particularly uh, for the HISC runs. Um, and as I mentioned before, Smaller parallel jobs work well for the second stage, and a lot of the physics is actually done on US QCD resources or at other supercomputer centers where we move the configurations later. Okay, uh, why, uh, again, blue waters? Uh, I mentioned that we're not always using up and down quark masses at light as in nature because it becomes more expensive to do the calculation when you um, reduce the quark mass. That's because the condition number of the matrix that you have to invert gets worse and worse as the quark mass is reduced. And so that means up until recently, we've been using quarks heavier than in nature. And we had to ex extrapolate all our um, physical observables to, um, to the right qu lower quark mass. And this is used uh, using something called chiral perturbation theory. And Blue Waters, for the first time, is allowing us to create ensembles of these configurations with small lattice spacing and quark masses that are as small as in nature. And that helps us eliminate the chiral perturbation theory calculation. And that extrapolation was a significant source of error to us uh, in the past. So it's really nice to be able to reduce that. Um, and then a comment about Blue Waters and the nuclear physics calculations. We think that Blue Waters has accelerated our um, pace of scientific progress by about a factor of 10. So it's been a very useful uh, machine for us for the last three years of our PRAC. Um, so now I want to go into some of the calculational issues that uh, Chalron said might be nice to people 
for people to hear about. So the first thing uh, is topological awareness. And what I have here is uh, two graphs for different phases of the HIST calculation. They're both done on a 144 cubed by 288 grid. Uh, it's four dimensional because it includes both space and time. At the top is uh, several runs that generate these configurations or snapshots of the vacuum. The X -ax or Y axis in each case is the number of node hours to accomplish the job. And up here in black on uh, 2048 uh, nodes is a job that uses the uh, grid order tool, but no topologically aware um, scheduling. And you can see that it takes a lot more time than these runs, which were done on different size uh, partitions, but they were all done with 16 processes per node after topological aware scheduling was applied. And you can see the scaling is pretty good in this case. Uh, it doesn't uh, take that much more to run on three times as many nodes. And then this is same size partition, but running on 24 processes uh, per, core, per node, sorry, uh, rather than just 16 up here. So this is quite a bit, uh, quite a nice reduction in the uh, amount of resources required to uh, run a, a job. And then this is for the spectrum analysis that we do. Uh, here we see reducing the number or uh, changing the number of processes per node didn't make much of a difference, but we got almost a f factor of two improvement and therefore we were able to get more done than we originally thought. So that's uh, some result of topological awareness. Um, this is actually a slide I showed last year, uh, but there's a little bit more to this story this year. So for the um, GPU code for the nuclear physics calculations that we're doing, um, they use uh, a code we call QDP, which is for quantum data parallel. Um, this library was first uh, is supported by the uh, DOE SIDAC program. And uh, Frank Winter has introduced just-in-time uh, compiling uh, to this code, and it's considerably improved the performance. Um, so what we have here is a time on the vertical axis, so lower is obviously better. And uh, what we have here is just um, CPU running in black, and that's like the original code. And then in blue, um, in addition to the, this is now running on the GPU nodes. This is with the GPU code CUDA, which is uh, the code that uh, the people at NVIDIA have helped develop so much. And we can see a considerable reduction and uh, somewhat better scaling. Scaling is pretty bad at this point. Uh, what Frank has done is introduce this just-in-time compilation, and it speeds up a lot of the rest of the code and this is just uh, a solver, uh, the blue part, the, the CUDA part. And the rest of the code is sped up quite nicely. And there's about a factor of four improvement. And this was described in these proceedings uh, two years ago. Um, but the story did not end there. Uh, what has happened uh, is that the original uh, implementation of QDP-JIT created PTX code. And that was just sent uh, to the GPU assembler. And uh, in the latest version, there's an internal representation that's uh, the output of the uh, JIT analysis or the JIT code. And this is sent to the LLVM compiler. And the back end of the LLVM can produce code for NVIDIA, for x86 architecture, including for Knight's Landing, and for PowerPC, where it's been used on the BlueGene. And so this is very important for the Chroma effort to uh, achieve performance portability. Um, OK. And uh, then Chowran also asked us to talk about the paid program. So we've been working with uh, Bill Gropp's group. I mentioned Alexei Bazovov before as uh, a postdoc at IU paid by paid. And there were two objectives initially. One is to increase the I.O. speed of the code, and another is to enhance performance of other parts of the code. Uh, Alexei, in particular, has uh, a lot of experience uh, in, in parts of the code that have not been looked at in a while, I guess. And the work started with looking at the Darshan logs. 
by Huang Lu, who was an NCSA postdoc of Bill Gropp, who uh, since has left. Um, so one immediate benefit of uh, starting to work with uh, Bill's group is what we were informed that the NCSA Luster uh, file system obeys POSIX standard. And we had had a parallel way of saving our configurations for many years, but it didn't always work on every uh, parallel file system. So we would use the serial uh, version, which was reliable, but much slower. Uh, so just going over to the parallel code, um, resulted in a factor of three improvement. Um, we also found on some runs we had very low performance. One of those turns out the striping was not sent, thanks, in the directory. Uh, and then we've been working with uh, Darren Adams and Ed Carrolls, who is here, sitting in my chair, that's okay. <laughs> uh, and we've been uh, working together, so we have a test case for helping them, and they had their own test case. Um, we have several different ways of uh, doing file I.O. So one is where we have multiple files, which tends to be fast, but it's not convenient for archiving. And really what we were hoping to do was uh, speed up the code that produces one file, which we can you know, then put on tape very easily, ship to another center. Uh, so Ed is working on that. We're looking at incorporating MPIO, uh, it's also been suggested to us by Bill and Ed that we could try asynchronous writing, and we really need to look at ways to increase the block size and alignment. So this is still very much uh, a work in progress. Uh, it's been slowed down in certain ways by people leaving, Bill breaking his leg, uh, someone's, Alexei's mother-in-law passing away, but you know, we're making progress. All right. Um, so the paid gauge force, which Alexei has been working on. So in QCD, we usually have these paths from one grid point to another grid point, and you have the, uh, the matrices represent the gauge fields, and you have to follow a path. So mostly there are matrix matrix multiplies, which have 198 flops and this much input and output, and matrix vector multiplies. Well, a long time uh, ago, I noticed that our gauge force routine, which is mostly matrix matrix multiplies and therefore has higher arithmetic incent, uh, intensity, is actually slower than the quark propagator solver, which we spend a lot of time on uh, optimizing because it takes the bulk of the time. But I was puzzled by why this was running slower, and I looked into it and decided it was a combination of cache unfriendliness and actually frequent non-overlapping communication. So I put a postdoc to work um, recoding it and just really breaking the style of milk, which is, uh, you know, it's the way we code and it's, uh, it's a certain paradigm for working your way around the lattice and doing things. Um, so the new code first fetches all matrices that you're gonna need, so there's no more um, communication in this routine after the, the first set of gathers, which is more extensive. And normally milk has loops over sites, each site on the grid. Uh, well, that would normally be um, kind of an inner loop. Uh, but we've done is um, t break that, and the inner loop is now a loop over paths. So it's much more cache friendly because you're doing a lot of different operations at a site before you go to the next site, whereas before we would do one multiply at each site, go to the next site, cycle through the whole lattice. So Alexei has integrated this into our code, and here higher is better, it's megaflops per rank. So this is the normal milk code. This is actually a strong scaling study, but um, it's kind of the way Alexei plotted this. This is the smallest number of nodes, and this is the largest number of nodes, because this is the local volume. And so what you can see is for the milk code, um, when you have a large local volume, the cache performance is not that good, and that's what's limiting you. And so the performance would go up this way. This is the code uh, that Basak uh, originally wrote to be more cache friendly, and the performance is quite a bit higher, and um, there's not that much uh, variation with larger volume, so the performance doesn't drop. Um, this is a code that James Osborne wrote, James Osborne's at uh, Argonne, 
And it actually doesn't have the same performance, but it eliminates a certain number of redundant computations. And so Alexei would really like to both get our higher performance and his reduced number of flops. And he's still working on that while he's with me. Uh, a slide on shared data. I guess I'm running out of time, right, Scott? OK. Um, so uh, we do, we've been sharing our data for a long time. Too bad Bill Kramer isn't in, in here, because when he was at NERSC uh, is when we started uh, sharing through the gauge connection at NERSC. And now there's something called the International Lattice Data Grid, which uh, helps people discover uh, the configurations or ensembles from different groups. We even have DOIs for a number of our ensembles now. Um, so the configurations that MILK makes are very much in use by the Fermilab Lattice and MILK collaboration, also by the HPC, uh, um, HPQCD collaboration. Um, and uh, in the past, a number of other groups have used our configurations. We'll see what happens with the HIST configurations. Um, some of our quark propagators are also solved and uh, saved and moved. Uh, the Clover propagators are stored at JLab. I'm not sure how many other groups are using their configurations. Um, well, here's a slide on why it matters. And I think I, sh I showed that last year. Uh, I think I'll sh say a little bit about this and the, the milk side. We calculate the CKM mixing matrix. So these are fundamental parameters of um, the standard model of elementary particle physics. And Kobayashi and Maskawa received the 2008 Nobel Prize for defining this matrix, uh, which occurs when there are three generations of quarks and can lead to an exotic property called CP violation that's observed in nature and is important for the baryon asymmetry of the universe. But it's not, it seems like the CP violation we see in the CKM matrix doesn't uh, provide for that. Um, however, they did win the Nobel Prize. Um, and um, so what we'd like to do is measure the, well, with the help of the experiments and theory, we'd like to determine what the elements of the matrix are, not just that it's a three by three matrix. And um, if you find that different, um, different decays say that a given matrix element has two different values, that's evidence that the standard model isn't describing this and there must be new physics. And then maybe you could get a prize too. So this is Kobayashi and Maskawa, after, ostensibly after they got the Nobel Prize. To me, they don't look that happy, but what am I going to tell you? And I have another picture, before picture. They didn't look much happier there either. Anyhow, this is the matrix in bold, and beneath it, are a bunch of these different decays. Uh, so they're names of particles. And these are actually mixing of two types of B mesons. So if you look at these different decays on the lattice and then an experiment, and you need the two to actually get the CKM matrix element, which is bold, you will get results. Um, so anyhow, here's that again. And these we're calculating on um, on blue waters, and we're also calculating this decay, and we're actually calculating uh, right now uh, this decay of a B, and these two decays down here. This was actually stolen from a, another talk, or I should have put more in. And um, this is uh, from a, a paper that we wrote about a year ago, some of our first results off of blue waters. So this is the decay, uh, the leptonic decays, and what it shows are the magnitude squared of two different matrix elements, one that turns a U quark into an S quark, and one that turns a U quark into a D quark. And this black line is what's called unitarity. So the CKM matrix is a unitary matrix. And so this band crosses this very nicely. It doesn't contradict unitarity. The vertical band does not come from our lattice calculations. It comes from nuclear beta decay. And so these two physical decays agree quite nicely with unitarity. However, this decay, which is a semi-leptonic decay, it's also done by El Aida El Khadra with a, a grant uh, on blue waters. This decay has a smaller uh, value than would be consistent with crossing the other two bands. 
Thanks, Scott. And so there's some tension here. We don't know what will happen. We'd like to increase the precision of our calculation, and we'd also like to see uh, an increase in precision in the experimental results. This is just a comment about why high precision is needed. Uh, this comment is that $300 million were used to upgrade JLab, uh, which is why it's important to do these things. This slide outlines the fact that we have um, nine papers produced uh, in archival journals, 11 conference proceedings since the grant started. And I'll just stop talking and let you read my conclusions. And thank you for your attention.